If you have a copy of the scriptures, would you open the Bible in the book of Daniel, chapter number one? We've been navigating the series of World Mandate through the book of Daniel, and this is week number three. Uh, last week was uh, obviously Father's Day, and we spoke clearly and, and, and intentionally and unapologetically of this ministry of succession. But when it comes to this conversation of the mandate of uh, going and being sent out, I, I have to be reminded on a Sunday like this, especially when a week from today we'll launch our Vacation Bible School officially on Sunday. So we'll still touch on the subject, although we're going to go into the Vacation Bible School topic. But l listen to me for a second, because um, in the first service, we have three services. In the first service, I had a couple of families that uh, that's typically the service that is kind of a you know populated by winter texans retirees and i had at least two two couples that came to me and basically said hey listen we just moved to the valley permanently they've been coming to the valley for a couple of years now and they moved permanently and we're thinking about joining the church so obviously that's you know music to my ears we we love to see people coming and joining but here's the but here here's the thing that i want i want to remind it Especially because they were here in the first service. So, again, I, I, I do not apologize for what I'm about to tell you. When we say discipling in a post-Christian world, our tendency is to think that we are the ones doing the discipling, discipling people. And we are. But our conversations never begin with us, never begin with what we do. So once I think of these newcomers, and by the way, today was the first Sunday of uh, the church membership class. It just happened an hour ago. Uh, we're going to do baptisms on the 7th, so the membership class is two Sundays uh, today and next Sunday, and then we'll baptize people. So whether you're coming for the first time visiting like these folks, thinking about joining the church, we, we have to begin and remind ourselves that this is, this is not about changing our behavior. This is about the behavior of Jesus. So the one who made disciples was Jesus, Right? The one who actually reproduced his character and he, his lifestyle on others was Jesus. Now, we're called to do that as well, but, but I want to warn you. I'm gonna, I want to give my disclaimer as we continue the series that when we say it in a Christian, in a post-Christian culture, again, we typically think of the craziness of our world, the brokenness of our society, which it is, and there is a lot of craziness going on. But if, if the focus of the disciple-making is Jesus... Ironically, Jesus attracted a lot of the culture. People that were not like Jesus really liked Jesus. People who were opposite of Jesus' worldview felt compelled to Jesus. Who is it that rejected Jesus? Who is it that gave the most trouble to Jesus? Yeah, religious people. People who should have known who Jesus was. So my point, here's my point, that when I speak of the disciple in a post-Christian culture, I said this before, I have three kids, we, my wife and I, we have three kids, and they grew up as pastor's kids and church kids. I, you know, I'm of the mindset that those are the generation and the people, just like you and I, church people, that we are sometimes in the most dangerous position. Why? Because our culture, our worldview, our, our surroundings say that it's about changing your behavior, improving your condition. And I'm not against those things, but the centrality of the gospel is the re regeneration of your soul. Not just what you do, but who you are. So in this case, this is why the centrality of this series has been chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Because I'm not going to read this to you. At the bottom of this um, section, you see a website and on our church app. If you download the app, you're going to see all of our sermons, audio and video. So I'm not going to repeat myself over the centrality of the book of Daniel, but this is what it's all about. It's about Jesus. It's the, the son of man coming and approaching the ancient of days. So it's not about Israel, you know, having the remorse and the repentance because they're in exile, because they're conquered by the Babylonians, and simply saying, oh, we got it. Forgive us. Let's come back and approach the ancient of days. The answer is not you coming to God. The answer is Jesus approaching the Father. And then Jesus, in this approach, we read from day one that he receives authority and glory and power. So if you are a follower of Jesus, it's because his authority, his glory, his majesty, which the price to pay, to inherit, to receive, we, we have called this to be restored cosmically. Right? Cosmic restoration of the one who knew no sin for our sake became sin is that now Jesus utilized all of his power for, for the nations, 
all of his power for the peoples of every language, where the freedom in Jesus is not that the people of God, Daniel and his generation, simply were restored back into the glorious days of the united monarchy with Saul, David, and Solomon. The beauty and the freedom in Jesus is that in spite of who you are, and regardless of your differences and your skin color and your background, you have the ability to do what? To worship the one true God. So if you're sitting in this place and you are a follower of Jesus, the beauty of the authority and the glory of Jesus is that now you have the ability to worship for the sake. This worship is for the sake, we said, to, to promote the dominion of Him, the dominion and the kingdom of the Son of Man, that is the dominion that is everlasting and is the kingdom that will never be destroyed. So what does that mean? Or how did Daniel exercise this? This is from last week. We simply said that Daniel was faithful to the concept of how many gods? One God. The one true God. And by the way, this is a new mindset. This is a new worldview. This is, this is something that goes against culture. So for the first time in human history, monotheism, he is going to remain faithful. So in other words, Daniel didn't just believe in God, but eventually had to believe God. So he was faithful. He was also respectful towards the brokenness of the system, which in this case is a system that is evil, that is broken, that is against the concept of the view of the scriptures. And eventually Daniel is able to do the contextualization, which here's contextualization. What it means is contextualization is simply the ability to convey the gospel to, to share the good news of Jesus in a manner that people understand. So what, what does that mean? Here's what it means. My wife and I, we have three kids, 22 years in the making, marriage, and three kids. In this generation of millennials and Gen Zs, you know, all these differences, and, you know, again, the gap continues to grow and all that kinds of stuff, I am not responsible for my children to believe in God. I'm only responsible to make sure that the gospel is clear so when they do believe in God and if they choose to believe in God, the message was clear enough. What's my point? That the transformation of the heart of my children is exclusively the work of the Holy Spirit. I cannot save anybody. But I am responsible that if somebody, in this case, rejects or chooses a different worldview from the Bible and chooses a worldview opposite of the Bible, I'm just res responsible that they are rejecting the gospel instead of a mockery or a caricature of the gospel. So for Daniel, that was his main drive. That was his contextualization that he has to promote and enlarge the beauty and the faithfulness of God in a context that was not very friendly. So how did he do that? Glad you asked. That's exactly where we were going. Verse 3 of chapter 1, very quickly. If you read verses 1 and 2, which I'm not going to give it to you on the screen, it's simply the tragedy of being abused, of being possessed, of being conquered by a foreign nation. So finally, the prophecy that is being, you know, given and, and warned and prophesied, it comes to pass. So the Bible says, verses 1 and 2, that Nebuchadnezzar with the Babylonian army just comes and overpowers and takes these people. Now, what you read in chapter 1 is basically an exile situation. Uh, some sort of, a, you know, human trafficking, uh, you know, violation of rights uh, and slavery. That's what you're looking at. In that context is when you find that the king, what did, what did he do? He exercised his kingship. He gave orders of what kings do. Kings, the king ordered Asphanas, the chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the, of the people that he has conquered. Some of the abusees, some of the people that had been violated, and now they are slaves, and those are the nation of Israel. Now, he wants specifically, he gives instructions. He wants those from royal family, and he wants from the families of the nobility. In this time in history, as you guys know, there is only two kind of a, two social status. You have the elite, the, 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 the VIP, the nobility, and then you have the rest of society. It is no accident that when we read uh, chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, and this son of man approach the ancient of days, you know, this, this imagery of Jesus coming into the world and paying the price for our redemption is not in the concept of royalty or nobility, but he comes and, and again, relates to those who had no hope. 
He came to the, to the helpless. He came to those who were marginalized. In this case, the king is looking exactly for the opposite. He's looking for royalty. He's looking for those who are in special uh, places. Why? Here's the why. The why is because the king, which is the most powerful nation in the world in this time in history, he's not looking to be accepted. He's looking to be celebrated. So, because there is more nations to conquer, he will utilize this nobility, this, this, this very exclusive people from the nations, and put them in his palace as some sort of a badges of honor. As a reminder and remind everybody that although these are the influencers, I rule over the influencers. That's exactly who I am. It is in that context that we find the narrative of verse 4. The Bible gives us details. This is a historical book, so he's given us a, a narrative and, and specifically talks about young men. So he wants the royalty, he wants the nobility of Israel, but among them he wants young people. Now let me ask you this question. Why do you think that he's looking for young people, or young men specifically? Have you noticed that in human history, the way to create the future, the way to change the course of history is through young people? That's the way to do it. You look at history. It is no accident that millennials, again, born between 1980 to 2000, you guys are the largest generation to ever live on the face of this beautiful country of ours. You are. We have never had that many people in this nation as your generation. And I say you because I'm obviously older than you. But, but in this case, think about this tragedy, how this individual by the name of Nebuchadnezzar, he is doing something that we've been talking for a while among ourselves, the ministry of succession. He is discipling a brand new generation. He is taking his own gospel, his own, you know, and we're fixing to read what that means. And, and he's intentionally, unapologetically reproducing himself in the lives of this younger generation. So look at what he does. What he does is he's taking those young men which are without any physical defect. They're handsome. They're showing aptitude. Again, translate that into nobility and royalty. They are the ones that have this aptitude for every kind of learning. They're well-informed. They're quick to understand. And they're qualified to serve in the, in the king's palace. So again, I'm sorry. I just have to give my little uh, side note. I'm a big basketball guy. This week was the actual NBA draft. So I'm thinking in my mind, you know, when you see the draft, when you see these guys who make it and sign those humongous contracts, I'm just thinking a very select group of people. That's, that's what comes to my mind. You know, there is tons of people in the United States who can play the game probably at the same level, the same, you know, kind of a, a giftedness or whatever, but only the few make this kind of a experience. That's what I'm thinking in a sense of the conversation between this king who is basically exercising what he is supposed to exercise. In this context, if you see the common denominator between aptitude and the ability to learn and being informed, it's interesting to me that these qualifications are not the qualifications that he wants to impose or give to this young man. What the Bible is implying is that this is the description and the qualities of this young man, they already have it prior to the exile. So what I'm trying to tell you is that what we see in here is the definition of people, young people who are wise, who, who understand and they have the ability to, 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 to merge themselves into a brand new experience. So the, the, the series is about navigating life in, in, in a context that is not conducive to the exaltation of the Scriptures, to the exaltation of the God of the Scriptures. Well, what's the point? That, that if you look at this, we see wisdom. That's, that's kind of a, the common denominator. It is no accident that a couple of hundred years earlier, uh, prior to these events, that there was the wisest man to live on the face of the earth. He is the son of King David. His name is Solomon. And Solomon comes into the picture, and the Bible describes on chapter 3 of 1 Kings that when he pray, ironically, this is just the irony of the Scriptures. This is the description of a king, Nebuchadnezzar, over the people of God. Now, uh, Solomon is actually ruling over the people of God. Is the king that God plays to rule over the people. And when he receives the commission, when he's commissioned to rule over the people, 
Chapter 3 of the book of Kings says that he made a prayer before the Lord. The prayer of Solomon is a prayer where he simply is asking for the knowledge to know the difference between good and, and evil. And out of this prayer, which is basically, this is what Solomon is saying. Solomon is saying, God, allow me to grow and to have access to your world view. As I navigate the ruling, as I navigate the, the, the enlargement of these people and, and the managing of these people, I want to make choices that has a very clear distinction between good and evil. And if you think about our context today, and I'm going to say this one more time because I don't want to sound critical, although we're fixing to go into or we are actually on the race for our presidential elections. You know, they're, they're, I mean, they're happening within the next, what is it, eight months or whatever months, we'll get a new president um, in, in this nation. This is a major topic. This is a major issue on how we make decisions. Well, what's my point? Here's my point, guys. That out of this prayer of Solomon, which we're basically saying, give me your worldview. Uh, here's where I am. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm ruling over the, your people. Uh, I want to embrace your worldview. Don't let me, don't allow me to redefine, reconsider goodness and evil. I want to embrace your, your worldview. It is out of this that God granted Solomon wisdom. What's the point? That Solomon never prayed for wisdom. He prayed for this. And this created wisdom. What's the opposite of wisdom? Non-wisdom, foolishness, craziness. Look at me. Non-wisdom is basically non-godliness. It, 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 it's the ability to move in the opposite direction of God. So, again, going back into history, there was another guy at the beginning of his human history that he had a major problem on, on choices, and he ate from the tree of good and... In other words, Adam was a fool. Adam made the mistake, instead of trusting in the worldview of God, he trusted his own understanding. So think about your life as you make choices. Think about your scenario. Think about as you grow in maybe elderly years, whatever you are in your life, what would you be remembered for? What, what will be the, 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 the way that we navigate life? See, this is what I want you to know. And again, i got to be honest. i got to give you the good, the bad, and the ugly of the Scriptures. I'd love for you to take with you today that Solomon made the best of choices in his life, and he did at the beginning. But does anybody remember how this whole narrative of Solomon ends? He eventually marries a bunch of women from other countries and cultures and worldviews. And what does he do? He falls into, look at me for a second. This is what he did. Because this, this is the concept of wisdom. Wisdom is simply taking the blessing, and God has blessed us. God continues to bless people. The blessing, and reminding that the blessing is the vehicle to exalt the blessor, the giver of the blessing. What Solomon did, unfortunately, at the end of his life, he took the blessing and made the blessing an idol. And he fell into idolatry towards women, towards marriage, towards pure and openness, idolatry and worship. And the end is, is radically sad. Solomon, unfortunately, took what was supposed to be a blessing. He idolized it, and eventually what is idolized becomes demonized. What you see with Adam is exactly the same thing. Adam had the blessing, had the opportunity to manage, to steward creation. And he makes the mistake to worship his stewardship, his ability to do and to make these choices. Well, again, the test is going to be failed by both individuals in this case. Think about Daniel. He's, he's facing exactly the same scenario where he is going to be labeled because his royalty, his nobility. And, and, and in this case, I'm reminded, I, I actually listened to this podcast two weeks ago, which attracted me not just because of the title of the podcast, it's a controversial topic, I know, and, you know, I was one year of age when the United States legalized Robbie Way, you know, legalized abortion. And, and on, a, on a topic like this, you probably are drawn into this word. I was drawn to these words, human rights, because I was expecting for the podcast, and it was a debate between a Christian and a non-Christian. The irony of the podcast, it was between two Christians. And the irony is that one of them that calls herself a Christian emphasizes human rights. Meaning, here's, here's the argument, that abortion is simply the choice that every woman has because she owns her own body. 
And, and, and again, I'm not, whatever you stand on these things, I can tell you what the Bible says, but that's not what I'm going with this. Here's what I'm going with you, because uh, uh, we just sang a song, that we're going to sing it again in just a second, but we just sang about how we are, we're not a slave to sin. Did we just sing that? That we're not a slave to fear? Paul uses in the book of Romans, chapter 6, chapter 7, the analogy of marriage to illustrate how we are free from sin. And the analogy of marriage, based on the culture of Paul, is that for someone to be free from marriage is either a letter of divorce or by simply your spouse dying. So now you're a widow. You are are free. You're not married anymore. It is no accident that this analogy of Paul, of freedom from sin, is not that sin die. Who is the person who die? The individual die. Why? Because when you come to know Jesus, the prerequisite for eternal life is that you have to, you have to die. What's, what am I saying? That this argument becomes nonsense to me, not because I, am, not because I believe in abortion, not because I'm pro-life. Here, here's why it becomes nonsense. Because the starting point is that when you, and if you are a follower of Jesus, you have lost all of your rights. Why? Because you are dead. Following Jesus means that you die, that you yourself had died. So, so again, I've been teaching this for a while, but let me rephrase that. I think you do have two rights based on the Old Testament and New Testament if you come to know Christ. In the Old Testament, the right that you have is for service. That's the doctrine of election. God elected Abraham to become a vehicle for redemption. So you, are, you have the right to serve. In the New Testament, doctrine of election, you have the right to walk in Christ's likeness. So now, If that's the preamble, if that's the foundation of any discussion, now translate that into this argument of abortion or any other argument. If the driving force of the Christian is to serve and is to live or walk or make decisions in Christ's likeness, it's obvious, it's pretty obvious that if we don't get that as a foundation, these conversations are nonsense. All that I'm trying to tell you is that as you think about discipling, as you think about reproducing yourself in others, would it be possible that the call that we have from God is to reproduce a life of service in a life of Christ-likeness? Can you imagine a generation of men and women at work, at church, family life, that the two things that are just become the, the engine that moves us is a life of service and a life of Christ-likeness? Well, eventually this brother by the name of Daniel is going to be tested. And here's how he's tested. He's tested by the authority of the king. And the Bible says that the king assigned them, who's them, this nobility, this young man, assigned them daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They, who's they? The, the young men, the nobility, the elite, they were to be trained for three years. And after that, they, those no, noble young men, were to enter the king's service. So, so here's the test. The test for Daniel is that as he continues to be a part of a very special select group, even within his calling as a prophet, is that Daniel is going to have to make a choice. Look at me for a second. Here's a choice. To, not to conform to be a leader with authority. As you move into the next phase of your life, maybe for you is relationships, is dating, getting a job, going to school, maybe for you is having kids, maybe it's having grandkids, whatever you are. What if we were the generation, just like Daniel, that in the context of a broken system, so I'm going to say this one more time, Daniel is not exercising his worldview in the most conducive scenario. Everything is against him, and yet this brokenness, it may be your marriage, it may be your health, it may be your sin, it may be the world that we lived in that is just broken. It may be regrets that are irreversible in your life because you cannot take time back. It's a perfect scenario for you to emulate the worldview of Jesus and remind yourself that Jesus took all of his leverage, all of his equality with God, Philippians chapter 2, and he did not consider. He took his dominion and his power and his mighty and used it for the sake of others. So Daniel becomes a leader, not with authority, but in this case, the leader that must be under authority. The beauty of this conversation for us as we pray and as we close our time together is that until you see this decision, which I hope and you can make it today, I hope and you are in this place making a transition that as much influence as you can potentially be, as much um, of a of, of, of dreams and desires and as much of whatever you've been entrusted that you can make the transition from with to under. It is only 
and only then that we see the beauty of this message reflected on how Daniel starts asking and is asking for permission. In other words, what Daniel is going to do, he becomes teachable by learning from the predecessors. In the Bible, you get Moses, you get Joseph. They both are placed within Jewish Hebrew mindset into non-Hebrew mindset context. One of them is called the Prince of Egypt, and the other one becomes the second in command of Egypt. And both of them remain faithful. So when they make the hall of faith in Hebrews 11, the Bible does not speak of their faithfulness as a badge of honor. The Bible simply speaks of their faithfulness, which is what your faith and my faith is, is simply the ability, the vehicle to enlarge, not Moses, not Joseph, much less Daniel, to enlarge Daniel 7, 13 and 14. What is this all about? To enlarge the character of Jesus. So I'm going to say this one more time. As a young person, as a single person, maybe choosing somebody to date and to marry, what if you were to choose an individual that he is a learner, and, and it's not that he's got new ideas, new technology, new education. What if we were learning from the past? What if we were following historical Christianity in a manner that we go back into the book of Daniel, and instead of being consumed by prophecy and the uncertainty of the future, what if we come back to understand that the call, the mandate is to follow what Jesus established from the very beginning? What if we were the generation that eventually through our lifestyle we get a now God what if the call this morning is that you walk you and I walk and make decisions with a now God experience see for most of us we would love to read on verse 9 now Israel now Daniel was free now Daniel was placed no look, look at what the Bible says the whole thing goes in full circle to expand to promote to, to, to literally show to the nations that although Israel is in captivity Although Nebuchadnezzar is in charge, God is sovereign. Although you may be in this place going through the valley of the shadow and death, although your last week and last month and your teenage years and your previous marriage was broken and you regret some of these things, look at me for a second. What, what if the message was, now God? Now God. The Bible says, now God. What did God do? God caused. Isn't that beautiful that the Bible describes God with verbs versus just nouns versus just theological statements? Now, I'm all for doctrine and theology. But look at, look at the, the proactivity of His love and, and the character of God always acting. So God in the context, God in spite of, God caused. What did He cause? Now, look at the verse. The Bible does not say that God caused for Israel to be free from Nebuchadnezzar to simply go down. Eventually, God is going to do what He does. But look at what God does in the midst of faithfulness to Him. Is that God simply show His favor and God show His compassion. Not because, the things, not because things change, but regardless of how difficult this was. This morning, as we disciple, as we go, as we receive vacation Bible school, what if we were the church? What if you and I were the families that we are known by the loyalty? The word is chesed. It's the concept of everlasting love. It's the love that has to do with the mercy of the God of the scriptures that is able to utilize sinfulness, brokenness, non-reversible, experiences and exalt not the person, not the situation, but those who put the trust in Jesus, exalt the character of Jesus. Would you please stand on your feet for one second?